code.org, we had a big, hairy, audacious goal, and that was to teach 10 million students one hour of computer science over the course of one week last year. Now, the thing that's really interesting about that goal is that we only had four months to do it. Start to finish, we had to build the entire infrastructure in four months. We started out with a legacy website that had a lot of content, but it was an out-of-date content management system, and it didn't scale. We hired a, a team of uh, consultants to come in and help us. They recommended swapping up to the newest version of that content management system, building new features on that, and then just importing the old data at the end. Sounds right. Unfortunately, two months later, we discovered that that wasn't going to work. By segregating all of the new features into this sort of ideal tower, we had basically done all the new work in a place that we couldn't ship because all the old content lived in the old CMS and hadn't been imported yet. So as a result, halfway through the project, we'd spent all of our money. Uh, we had nothing physically to show for it to our customers, and we were terrified that we were going to fail at this amazing event. So something had to change. So my boss, Hadi, called me into his office, and he said to me, this is on a Friday afternoon, I need a solution by Monday. Basically, we don't have the money to pay the consultants anymore, so what happens if you're the only person left? <laughs> so I went home early on Friday, and uh, I started thinking about people and process and technology. And I said, you know, if we don't have an army of consultants, then what I need to do is leverage the people we do have. That means regular folks at the company, administrators, assistants, other developers, every single person needed to be somebody that I could potentially leverage to get us out the door. Uh, second, I thought about performance, and you've heard caching a lot in other people's speeches, and one of the things that uh, I realized about that is that performance isn't about how quickly you generate pages, it's about how quickly you serve them. And so if we could move the performance problem from worrying about page generation to just getting those pages served quickly, then we didn't have to optimize in all the places that you might traditionally optimize. Uh, the other thing I noticed was that the, the people or person who cared most about the content we were shipping often had no direct access to changing it. So we had this loop. Hadi or somebody else would think of a feature, they'd write a spec, they'd hand it to a developer, a developer would read it, and write some code, then they'd show it to Hadi, he'd look at it, he'd review it, he'd write up his response, he'd send the response to the developer, the developer would make some changes, and we'd repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. And I said, you know, we don't have enough time for that. So, uh, and then the fourth thing I noticed was that our developers were spending a lot of time building user interfaces that were only ever seen by other people on our team. And to me, that's a waste. Other people on our team can be trained to deal with things that are a little bit ugly or, or you know, not that great. So. On Monday morning, I came in with a plan. Starting with naming matter, uh, I came in with this idea that we were going to call this thing Pegasus. I said, Pegasus is our way of gaining lift and speed. It's going to set us in motion. It's going to get us to run. Uh, it gave people a chance to sort of rally behind a name, give people something to identify with, and give people a way to sort of reset their memory. Um, second thing. Starting from scratch doesn't work, so don't do it. Uh, as I said earlier, if you start from scratch, you end up often with, with data segregated where some features aren't ready to ship because you don't have the old stuff in mixed in with it. So Pegasus, instead of starting from scratch, acted as a thin layer on top of our existing content management system. Instead of, instead of replacing it entirely, it just forwarded requests to it, and then as the responses came back, it would rewrite the headers and footers so that the content looked right, and then ship it up to the rest of the people, uh, to, the, to the web browser. Uh, for new content, we could, oops, uh, for new content, we could just write it in what we called Pegasus, and then serve that up directly. And so in that way, we never had to get rid of the old content management system in order to start working on the new one. We could literally just paper over the pages that we wanted to replace. Uh, so performance being about how quickly you serve content and not versus generating it, uh, the system that I'm describing where we have one server that connects to another server to download a page and then rewrites the headers, all of this stuff ends up being relatively slow. It can take one, two, three, sometimes even 20 seconds to generate a page. 
But once that page is generated, if we put it into a cache, that cache can deliver that page to as many people that want to come to the visit the site as you can imagine as quickly as you know, basically memory allows. Um, and so we designed the app from the beginning with caching in mind. And we set a one hour lifetime on every resource that we return from our, from our site. So what that effectively meant was that our application servers would only ever see one request per page on our site per hour, no matter how much traffic we actually received. And so, in terms of scalability, that's amazing. Uh, in terms of giving direct access to the people who care most, uh, and avoiding building user experiences for our, for our internal employees, uh, I decided to use Dropbox as our main point for publishing. So, everybody on our team was instructed to join a Dropbox folder that had all of our site content on it. All of our new site content was implemented in Markdown, and we offered folks a bunch of options for Markdown editors that they could use so that they could use familiar sort of keyboard shortcuts just like using Word or Pages or anything else that they were familiar with. But the key was they were saving text files to a Dropbox. And those text files, well, Dropbox would then sync those files to a staging server for us, and those people could then immediately go to that staging server and see their changes. So this meant that Hadi no longer had to write a spec, give it to me, have me do anything, uh, and then go through that whole review cycle. Instead, Hadi could just express what he wanted to express as best he could, iterate it on it until he got it as good as he could, and then come see me about the last final details that he said just needed, you know, he couldn't figure out or just needed to be a certain way. Um, and so that was how we, we managed to get the majority of our pages uh, implemented by regular folks at our company rather than developers. The other thing that I noticed about building user experiences for our employees was that we were doing it for data entry. So we often had cases where we would get Excel files, uh, CSV files, things like that, and have to input the data into our website. And traditionally with a CMS, somebody would build a form and a table and some other person would start typing these things in or they would try to do an import process. Um, it was a pain. So for Pegasus, what we did instead was we used a, um, uh, effectively a schema list system. Each CSV file had a header column, and those header columns defined the types of data that were in them. So for example, the name column would be suffixed with underscore s to say that the name column was a string. Uh, you could suffix it with underscore i, and you would end up with an integer. If you added a star at the end, that meant that we were supposed to index the column, and if you added an exclamation point, then it meant the column was a unique value. And so with a very small set of tools, I could actually now hand not CSV files, not Excel files, but actually Google Sheets to the rest of the folks on the team, and they could collaborate in a tool that they already knew to basically populate our database. And like the Dropbox folder, this stuff happened automatically, so that they could make a change in a Google Sheet and then literally refresh our staging server and within a minute, their changes would be visible. So again, this completely eliminated the developers from the feedback loop of getting content on our site, moved it all to the people who care, and saved us a tremendous amount of process time. Uh, we had tremendous success on Amazon. So, we ended up releasing uh, for the Hour of Code, which was an event that went from zero users to 10 million users in one week uh, on 250 EC2 instances. We had 50 application server instances, which we considered writers because they were primarily responsible for form processing. And then we had 200 varnish-only instances that we considered readers, and these were basically our, our units of bandwidth. And what we did that's sort of a non-traditional configuration uh, was we put Varnish on their own instances. So traditionally, Varnish lives on the same instance as your application server. But what we noticed was that in that configuration, we would run out of CPU utilization on those, on, we would run out of CPU, or bandwidth, before we'd run out of CPU on our application servers. So by moving Varnish off onto their own instances, we could actually have four Varnishes per application server and save ourselves a ton of money. It turns out the Varnish instances cost one-tenth as much as an application server, and so with 200 of them, we ended up saving 285% over what it would have cost us to run all of those application servers underutilized. Uh, that's it, thank you.